This past Tuesday, I was up in this long meeting um, for our denomination in, in Indiana, and at the beginning of the meeting, um, they were talking, and, and randomly, um, I felt like um, the Lord was saying I needed to specifically speak to our teens this week. So honestly, since Tuesday, um, I have been praying for y'all, um, processing with God for you all. Um, and while you don't have to be a teen to receive something from it, there was a uniqueness to what I felt like, um, especially as we got toward the end of the week, I was like, oh, I see what you're doing, Lord. Got it. Um, so I, it's honestly been really cool as I've kind of prayed for you um, and saw your faces while I was praying too. Uh, so that's why that switch is today, that you're not upstairs. You'll get an opportunity to do that in a couple of weeks, but I just wanted to specifically be speaking to you all today. Um, and... That, um, so the title of the sermon is God Sees You, God Knows You. Um, and <laughs> uh, the, we're going to actually be in Ruth. Honestly, it's just the story of Ruth. There's only one portion of scripture that we're going to read out of Ruth. It'll be on the screen. Um, but then we'll also um, be in Jeremiah. I'm going to pray first, and then we'll jump into that. Father, thank you that you are with us. You are for us and you care about us and we get to come into your presence. We get to worship you together and have fellowship with one another. It is because of the um, life and sacrifice of your son and specifically the resurrection and the power that has come through the Holy Spirit that we are able to even do this. So Lord, we pray that you would continue to move in our time together. That would be, we would be both encouraged and convicted by your word and let every single thing I say bring you glory and build up our teens and the rest of this body. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I said you were going to be in Ruth. And legitimately, I'm going to tell you the bullet-pointed version of the story of Ruth. But I need... A little help. <laughs> and I'm not, so you're not going to have to like act or say anything, but I actually just need like six humans, preferably two of which would consider yourselves, um, I'm seasoned. Um, you know, I'm in the, um, you know, I'm, 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 I have lived long enough to have children who are adults. Um, uh, I just need two of those. I need two, like, seasoned saints and then four anybody's. <laughs> uh, excuse me, four, four seasoned saints and two anybody's. Yep. Oh, and uh, yep. So, I got, so, I, so now I need actually then three men. Sorry. So the, you're good, Carmelita. Uh, Tony's coming. I need, I need three men now. Thanks, David. I need one more. Okay, yep, Mark, okay. And Joey, come on up. All right, perfect. You can actually come up here. Because before we start talking about the story of Ruth, there's some groundwork you have to actually understand about the story of Ruth. Thank you very much for being willing to participate in this way. Okay? Or they're like, what are we doing? It's not, trust me when I tell you, it's not, this is not Nickelodeon. I ain't going to slime you and nothing weird. You don't have to say anything. You're just models. <laughs> huh? Do, we win prizes? do you do win prizes? And those prizes are our undying gratitude. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Ruth, the book of Ruth takes place in a time and even a place in the world that's very different than what we live in right now. So it's important that we understand the cultural, some of the cultural dynamics of Ruth before we even talk about the story of Ruth or it won't make sense to us, right? So we need to talk about the system of marriage in Ruth because it's different. 
It's different, and there was different reasons for why people got married back in Ruth's time. So I'm going to couple y'all up real quick. So I'm going to say, here, Joey and Leasa, I need y'all to be over here. And then I'm going to say, Brenda, you come over here. And then Tony and David. Okay, great. Excellent. All right. So marriage, back when Ruth was Ruthing, um, <laughs> was not about like, oh, I find somebody whom I'm in love with and we, you know, we get married and we start off our life together. That is a system of navigating marriage. That's typically how we do. But really back then and in this culture, marriage was a function of family development and also inheritance. So it was less about like falling in love with somebody, and primarily it served two functions. Well, I should say this. It primarily served one function in their time period in that culture, and that is how do we ensure that a family's line never dies and we get to pass along this land? So this land was given to a family, and We need to ensure that this land stays in the family. Marriage is a primary mechanism for that. It ensures that there's going to be an heir for this land. You with me? Right? The second thing was not something that was cultural all around, but was specific to God's people. Marriage was also a means for honoring women because in that time period, women could not own land. Women did not. Ha- there was a lot of barriers to a woman being able to, be, to function independently in that social con- context. So, in, so God made laws to ensure that women still were honored in that process. So a man couldn't just like get married and be like, ah, I don't like the way you look this morning, so I'm going to just divorce you. No, because when you do that, then you've basically created an environment for her to not be able to thrive and live well. I want to say this out loud. God didn't make up that system. Oftentimes when we're reading scripture, we're like trying to figure out like, why is this the way that it is? God didn't make up that, that, that system. Just like God didn't make up the systems that we live in. God didn't make up the system called capitalism. God didn't make that up. But God often moves in that, right? God made a way for women to be honored in this. And so we're going to say, Leasa, you come over here for a second. Okay. Leasa is the beloved daughter of Mark and Brenda. (laughs) (laughs) And Joey is the beloved son of David and Tony. (laughs) Hey, son. Now, all right. Ultimately, in in this system, in this context, it's David's land And he needs to ensure that his family line doesn't die. So he has his son. I'm just going to bring you up to the side. Okay. And then then there's someone, and you can stand right in the middle. And then they're friends with this family right here. And then they say, okay, come on up here, daughter. Let's make sure you're good. Right? (laughs) Ultimately, in this system, if this doesn't happen, two things do not happen. This land becomes no one's, and it no, so there's no family that it represents, and it, it's just, and their relationship to God's promised land was important enough that they ensured that someone was always caring for it. So no one's caring for it, and if this doesn't happen, when they pass, no one is making sure that the daughter is thriving. Right? So until she gets married, they are ensuring that she's good. That is how this system works. You have to understand that, or Ruth doesn't make sense. You with me though? Right? Okay, thank you. Y'all are good. Thank you for being our models. Our undying gratitude lives on forever. (laughs) Okay. All right. So that's where we come in. And we, so we understand that there'll be another moment where I'm explaining something, but I won't need any models for that. Uh, so before we start talk about, talking about Ruth, there's also some backstory. 
there is a man named Elimelech who has a wife named Naomi and two sons named Malan and Kilion. They live in Bethlehem. And during the time where they're living, there's a famine. So for those of us who might not be familiar with that word famine, is there's no more food at Meyer or Family Fair or D&W or any other place where you get food, <laughs> right? It's there's nothing. Famine means if we don't do something, we will all die of starvation. That's what famine is, right? So Elimelech and Naomi... And their two sons, Milan and, and Kilion, they get up and they move to Moab. And when they're in Moab, um, uh, they, Elimelech dies. But Naomi's, I mean, she's sad, but she's still cared for because she has two sons. Right? Remember that whole thing played out. They've got, there's someone who's caring really for her in that context. So the two sons are there. The two sons get married. One son marries a woman named Orpah, which when I first read that, I was like, there's Oprah in the Bible. Like, <laughs> nope, Orpah. No, <laughs> Orpah. And Ruth is also one of those wives. That's where she comes into the story. And 10 years after Elimelech dies, Milan and Kilion also die. Right? So herein lies the problem. They, none of them had any kids. So you've got now three women, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth, all of which are in a foreign land to Naomi and there is no way in which for them to actually be thriving in that context. That's the problem, right? The famine lifts in Bethlehem, and Naomi is like, hey, you know what? I feel like I'm going to be better off with being at home than being here in this foreign land. But the two of you ladies, Orpah, Ruth, y'all are still young, Go find you another husband <laughs> because we know what the this, this system is. If you are not cared for, we all are basically just, we're just going to starve out here. You go back. I'll try to figure it out on my own in Bethlehem. They, uh, and both of them are like, no, mom, no, no, we want to be with you. Naomi is like, mm, nah, I really didn't think y'all should go. They cry. Orpah's like, all right, then I'm leaving. <laughs> Cause, uh, and she doesn't give a reason other than she just goes off. And Ruth does not. She stays. And, this, and she specifically says this. And this is becoming the, like, the moment in which this becomes Ruth's relationship with God as well. Naomi asked, told her, hey, you can go, daughter, go with Orpah, go find another husband. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. That is a big deal in the story of Ruth. Because that's the moment in which Ruth, it, wasn't, it was no longer just this system situation that she ended up in Naomi's life, right? Before it was because of the system of marriage. So I need somebody to take care of me. You need somebody to carry on your line. Then that means I'm going to marry your son. Now this all bets are off. That's a completely different thing now. now Ruth says, regardless of what happens, I'm with you. And as much as you trust that God, I will too. Amen. That's what happens there. And then they both go back to Bethlehem and they begin their life together there. All right. Pause in the story. You can actually put that next picture up because it's just back to the story of Ruth. In that time, God had set up a system for the, Jew, the Jewish people, the children of Israel, for those who were impoverished. Um, and so it wasn't, we didn't have the same kind of economic system. Much of it was just them farming. So that system was that if 
there was someone who was poor, they could go into someone else's farm, someone else's land, and as the people were harvesting crops, anything that fell on the ground, they could pick up and they can eat. That was theirs. That was their kind of economic assistance system, right? It's important for us to know that too, because Ruth and Naomi, they come back to Bethlehem and they have zero things. <laughs> they have nothing. They go back to the land that was there, but they, they actually, at this point, can't do anything to cultivate it and they don't even own it, <laughs> right? It's just not how that works. So, Ruth is like, hey, I'm going to go find somebody who I can just kind of pick up the scraps after they drop them, and that way we can eat, because she knows that that's the system. Here's the thing. She just so happens to choose a farm that belongs to a close family member of Naomi's husband. That's important because that's the way in which like this close family member, we would call it something like next of kin, would be responsible for caring for them. And so she happens to land in his farm and she's working alongside his harvesters and his name is Boaz. And Boaz is nice to her, is kind. She goes back to Naomi like, yo, mom. This man was nice to me. He made sure I had everything I needed. He also protected me while I was there. Naomi was like, mm, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing, God. <laughs> she then ultimately creates this um, plan, really, for Boaz to do what's called redeem their family. He ends up marrying Ruth redeeming their land, and they have children that can continue on with the inheritance. But the beautiful, honestly, my favorite part about the story of Ruth isn't just that all of that worked out for Ruth. Because if we're tracking along with the story and the system, if Ruth doesn't get married again, she basically lives out a life of poverty, and, she, and no one remembers her she, at all. But in this story, in this, in this way, her dedication to Naomi and specifically her allegiance to Naomi's God, Yahweh, the God of all creation, positions her to not only be cared for, but then she also becomes one of the great, 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 great grandmothers of Jesus. One of my favorite aspects of this story, right? Like, so I needed us to hear that whole story, right? There's lots of details, Listen to Ruth or read it. It's a great, great, it's a great story. There's a lot of intricate details in there. But I needed us to see how this was kind of plodding along. Because when we're reading Ruth just as a narrative, not thinking above the storyline, then we miss some puzzle pieces. God working in and through Ruth's life in that system is an important puzzle piece. So I want us to see this note, because I think if we're going to get anything from Ruth, we need to see this picture. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, go to God exists above the timeline. This isn't Ruth. This is just some random guy. Um, <laughs> but we have, before we can actually really even get anything from Ruth and even see what might be valuable for us to live from Ruth is God exists above the timeline. Why is that important? Oftentimes we're like, God is in the mix moving, like he tells me what I should wear in the morning and then he tells me who I should talk to. No, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. But God sees the whole thing from the beginning to the end and is engaged at pivotal moments. That's, an, that's just something that we can even see in Ruth's life. Even before Ruth met Naomi and her family, God could see the beginning all the way to the end. And that's an important puzzle piece even in your life. And I, 
I, as you can see, my timeline has an arrow going in both ways because it's okay for us to both all know that the world doesn't ex, you know, exist around me, <laughs> right? Like it was here before and it'll be here after. But if we're going to just talk about my life, talk about your life, God sees your life from beginning all the way to the end as in, and is involved and invested and in, at pivotal moments and all the way through if you let him. The moment Ruth said, your God will be my God, was a pivotal moment in Ruth's life. Amen. That God then is doing things that's beyond just making sure Ruth eats today. Which, let's be real, when you read the story of Ruth, God made sure, and it was like, listen, you're going to have more than enough food. <laughs> And you're not going to even have to work that hard. I know the system means that you're picking up stuff as you, you know what? I'm telling them to just drop stuff for you at this point. You need some more grain here. Just have a whole bunch of grain. <laughs> Naomi and Ruth are cared for in this situation. God's in, intimately engaged, seeing the beginning to the end, and even providing for generations beyond what Ruth would ever see. And that is true of your life too. God exists above the timeline, and that's an important puzzle piece. Go to this, that next slide for me. If that's true, then trusting the God who knows me at every point in my life gives me confidence today. Here's the thing that I was in the middle of the week kind of wrestling with. You're at a point in your life where you're trying to figure out not only who you are, but also how you fit within all of the things that you're doing. Who am I in the social sphere at school? Who am I in my family? Who am I, what are my talents? What are my passions? What do I want to do? do even if you're thinking about like what, what am I called to and all of those things. And honestly, at, especially when we first start thinking about that kind of stuff, we're not confident at all. And we find ourselves looking around at the people around us, whether it be in media, social media, or our peers, like, okay, she seems confident. Let me do what she's doing. He seems confident. Let me do what he's doing. And quite honestly, nobody is confident at that time. <laughs> Everybody in this room who's lived beyond that knows, man, we were all just trying to make it, <laughs> okay? Getting up in the morning, making sure that we didn't, okay, nobody is going to blaze me up. Great. <laughs> Basically, that's just how we functioned. I need to just get by today with nobody saying anything that's going to make me spiral, and if I can... Glory to God. <laughs> if I can't, God, you left me at lunch. That's how, and that doesn't, that's not just our teenage years. That goes into young adulthood. And if there's nothing that ever interrupts that, that pattern, it travels with us all the way through our lives. There are 80-year-olds who still live in that anxiety of what am I supposed to be doing, who am I, what's my life, and how do they see it? But if God exists above the timeline and can see me at every point, then trusting this God gives me confidence today. I can wake up today trusting this God who sees me at every point and is working for my good at every point, just like he was working for Ruth's good at every single point, just like he, there's so many stories in scripture where God is working for their good at every point, especially at every pivotal moment. Here's the challenge with me trying to figure out what I like right now and trying to build my life upon what I see right now. The challenge there is, when I was five, I liked stuff that I didn't like when I was 15. <laughs> Just somebody shout out one thing you like when you were five that you did not like by the time you turned 15. It don't even matter. Just shout it out. Mud. mud. <laughs> Come on, mud. Barney. 
Uh, it's all right. Look, see. So you ain't got there yet. You're still, you're still growing. He said, I still, he said, I still like Barney, but I'm 12. Listen, you got three years. Trust me. When you get there, you won't. No. <laughs> okay. There are things about who you were at five years old that do not apply to you at 15. Those of us who have lived an another few decades, there were some things about us at 15 that do not, did not apply at 25. There's some things that we did not like that all of a sudden we did like. <laughs> oh, five years old, you little nasty girls or boys. 25, like, listen, girl or boy, come here. <laughs> There's something that changes in us that happens multiple times in our life. And if we're trying to build our life over what on, based on what I know of me right now, I'm trying to build my life based upon what I feel right now. I'm trying to build my life based upon what I'm excited about right now. You will be very, very frustrated with your life 10 years from now because it's going to change. But there is a God who sees me and knows me at every point. He saw me at five and saw what would stay there until I was 45. He saw me at five and knew what would change abruptly at 10. And even when those moments are hard, God is still with me through that process, working for my good in that process. That's the, one of the most beautiful things about the story of Ruth, because if God is above the timeline, the moment she says, your God will be my God, she starts trusting in this God that sees more than she does. And I want to encourage you, trust in a God that sees more than you do. Amen. That doesn't mean that what you feel is not important or valid. It just means I can't build my life on what I feel today. God, I feel this today. Help me manage this today. And also, guide me to the good you see for me at 30. <laughs> guide me to the good you see for me in, in 10 years. The second part is something, too, that we have to remember. Go on to that next slide for me. God wants good for me. That's actually more difficult to believe than the first one. The longer we live, the more this one is the one that's more of a challenge. I'll just accept that God lives above the timeline. But this thing, when I have to go collect somebody's scraps, God wants good for me. When I live in a system that basically just kind of moves women around as pawns in somebody else's plan, God wants good for me. This is the thing that actually requires quite a bit more faith. Because we're really, really good at looking at what's in front of us and defining and deciding if God wants good for me based upon what I see and I feel right now. If I feel good, God wants good. If I feel like trash, God's heaping garbage on me. That's not just you. That's honestly all of humanity. And it takes way more discipline, way more faith for us to trust this. And that's another reason why the story of Ruth is important because even in the system that they lived in where Ruth has to pick up somebody's scraps, God still is providing and doing good in that, not just with the food part, because if that system didn't exist, even though the system itself feels messy, if the system didn't exist, then Ruth never meets Boaz. And she never actually, this process never actually gets played out in terms of her being able to have their family redeemed and the land redeemed, and she never gets to be the great, 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 great grandmama of Jesus. 
God wants good for me. That's something that when I experience hardship, I actually have to say out loud. I'm just saying we have to say that out loud. That's not something that you can just, just like, oh, God was good for me, and then move on. And all the while, I'm still thinking that my life's trash and God doesn't love me. Mm, there's at some point, we look at the hard thing in front of us, and we say, God wants good for me, even though that feels like trash. If those two things are not stuff that we can adopt, kind of like Ruth says, where you live, I'll live. Where you go, I'll go. Your God will be your, my God, your people, my people. If we can't adopt those two things, Ruth's story doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. It may as well just be on Disney Plus because it's like, it's not real. <laughs> Fantasy. Bippity boppity boo. But if those two things are true, that God exists above the timeline and God wants good for me, then Ruth's story makes sense. And your life can also have a pattern that is for your good and honestly for the good of people around you too. They get to see the truth that God wants good for you. They get to see the truth. And that doesn't, and this is where it's hard. I know that this is hard. Because there are times when we're flat out overwhelmed by the challenge that's in front of us. I love the story of Ruth because there's nothing that's easy about what Naomi and Ruth faced. Yet God wanted good for them. And God wants good for you. And it doesn't matter what you're seeing in front of you. There is a truth that I choose to believe because it's been played out over and over again. It's not something I'm making up. It's been played out over and over again. God wants good for me. So now we can go to that Jeremiah verse. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a lot of people's favorite verse. And the context is not just some random scripture, Right? Jeremiah was talking to a people who were literally getting kicked out of their life. They're getting exiled. Like, <laughs> y'all didn't want to follow God? Well, then you're getting kicked out of the land, right? And then Jeremiah says, but you're going to come back to the land. That's an important puzzle piece, right? This God that lives above the timeline. Seeing all of the things going on. Even in the middle of them and their deep pain, God can say to them, you're not going to always be exiled. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. And I need us to pause there. That is important. I'm not saying you have to make that your life verse. Some people do. Uh, that's not even, I don't, like, that's not a law. Everybody has to have a, a life verse. But I do want you to catch the truth that exists there. And even though God is speaking through Jeremiah to a specific group of people, it applies to you too. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're for your good, not for your disaster. Go on to those next two verses for me. And he's talking about when you're back in the land, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I felt like in the middle of the week when I was praying for you and also what I believed that the Spirit wanted you to hear is specifically that latter part. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. There is, a, there is a challenge 
that does not go away when you get out of school. Living in a world that does not trust or even oftentimes believe that this God exists makes it very difficult and oftentimes an uphill battle. But that truth remains. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. And if you trust this God that you find, who sees everything, you will have the confidence to be able to live well and free right now. And when life gets challenging, when life gets challenging, I know I've got Rachel going all over the place. Go to that, uh, yes. When life is hard, I can still see God's goodness if I stop and look. I can still see God's goodness if I stop and look. But most of the time, we just keep going and we don't stop. Stop and look. That this God desires good for you. And if you trust God, God will make sure that throughout life, you can see God's hand moving for your good throughout it. That's it. I'm going to pray. And then we can bounce. (laughs) Father, thank you that you care, that you love us richly. That you see all the things, the wonderful things and things that are also challenging. You see them. And you're working for our good in all of it. Give us grace to trust you through that. And even when it's hard, give us grace to remember that you desire good for us. And and also allow that to fuel my trust and faith of you. Give us that. I specifically pray for um, our teens, God, who are navigating pressures and challenges in school and challenges with the peers, challenges in a world that honestly feels so incredibly unstable. Lord, I pray that you would give them more and more trust in you and that that would steady the part of their life that feels shaky. It will be you. Not whether or not they said the right thing, not whether or not they did the right thing, not whether or not they had the right thing, but it would be you. Help us all as your people to live a steadied faith in you, God. We trust you. And when it's hard to, help us trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.